Uh, presiding officer, um, I, unlike Charles Henry, am definitely not a retreaty. I very much welcome the opportunity to engage in a wider range of subjects. Let me start by saying electricity market reform is both necessary and urgent. For Scotland, a reformed market in these islands and across Europe must create the conditions for the creation of the physical and economic infrastructure that allows the export of a key product from our fastest growing 21st century industry, renewable energy. History tells us that economic development is driven by access to energy. Over the last few hundred years, that has been most importantly for us, access to coal and oil. And of course, an education system that gave us the engineers to drive forward new industries based on access to energy. Some of this ain't new. The first wind turbines were in operation in 200 BC. And the first wind turbine in the world to generate electricity was installed in Marykirk by the Scottish academic James Blythe in July 1887, 135 years ago. But unlike the previous source of energy upon which we relied, modern renewable energy is kind to the environment. We now have power generation where the environmental costs are exceeded by the benefits. No particulate pollution inhaled by workers and residents. No oxides of sulfur and nitrogen to damage lungs and plants. No CO2 to warm the planet. But investment in power generation is investment for the long term. Therefore, investors need long-term confidence about the fiscal environment within which they will operate. They cannot easily transfer generating equipment to another part of the world if the government changes the rules. Quite different from other manufacturing industries. Manufacturing power is locked to local sites. It gives us long-term economic benefit if we provide long-term certainty. The passage of the Climate Change Act in 2009 with unanimity in this Parliament is one of the underpinnings that has given the renewables industry the confidence to invest. Whatever the political vicissitudes which may affect any party in a democracy, whatever the nature of future governments in Scotland, we made that shared commitment which others now rely on and from which our economy gains. We can already see the effect of reneging on deals. The Kyoto Protocol represented an international agreement to essentially create a carbon market so that the environmental cost of human activity would carry an associated economic cost. When the United States resiled from its international obligations under Kyoto, the international market in carbon all but collapsed. The European Emissions Trading Scheme has taken up some of the slack, but for a number of EU countries, notably Poland, the loss of Kyoto revenue not unreasonably makes it difficult to strengthen targets in Europe while others turn their back on duty. Indeed, I was leading the UK delegation in Durban for the 17th Conference of the Parties meeting in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change when the United States came to speak to plenary. Such was the hostility to the United States delegate that he had to shorten his speech and leave the podium much earlier than anticipated. When you sacrifice long-term necessities by trimming to short-term needs, you sacrifice trust. Trust built in a life sacrificed in a second. So I very much welcome the positive collaboration between the Scottish and Westminster governments on this agenda, and indeed the international engagement our ministers are having with countries across Europe. So what are my personal tests to measure success in EMR? Firstly, consensus across jurisdictions and political parties, long-term stability. Second, equal access to networks, a point usefully highlighted by the Labour Amendment today, supporting community and industrial scale generation. Thirdly, progressing the carbon reduction agenda and supporting the Climate Change Act in Scotland and at Westminster, saving the planet. Fourthly, delivering affordable energy, tackling fuel poverty, John Wilson, Rhoda Grant have mentioned. Fifthly, building our economy, gaining a reward for effort. But there are signs of difficulty. Westminster has an unhealthy focus on gas. Yes, the CO2 from gas generation of power is much less than from coal. But without carbon capture and storage, the emissions remain too high. 
John Selwyn Gummer, now Lord Debden, chairs UK Climate Change Committee. His committee have just written to the Westminster government to make clear that a focus on gas is a focus on climate failure. Let's hope he maintains close relations with his political colleagues and gets that message across. Carbon capture and storage is not the long-term answer. We have to do more, but it can deliver substantial intermediate-term benefits. Now, China is not normally regarded as a climate champion, but it's already building better wind turbines by using its access to rare earths for better magnets. In my constituency, we are ready to follow their lead. They have seven carbon capture uh, plants already operational. Martina Navratilova once said, it's not how I play when I'm at my best that means I win, it's how I play when I'm at my worst that makes me a champion. On the climate agenda, it's similarly how we respond when the economic, social and environmental challenge is at its greatest that will determine our success or failure to combat global warming. I'm very happy to support the government and the Labour Party's uh, motions before us today.